I was doing some homework today for macroeconomics, and I came across a, uh, a little story that I thought was really interesting. Um, so I'm going to read it to you. It's from my my macroeconomics book, specifically. Uh, this is uh, chapter 17, um, which is about uh, money, growth, and inflation. Anyway, um, it's a really interesting story. And also, I haven't made a video in a while because I've been doing this. So I might as well just make a fucking video about this. Alright, uh, let me put my new glasses on. Schwa! No, fuck all of you. Just fuck you. My less than Jake shirt completely offsets these glasses. Go fuck yourself. Alright, this story, boys and girls, is called The Wizard of Oz and the Free Silver Debate. <coughs> As a child, you probably saw the movie The Wizard of Oz, based on a children's book written in 1900. The movie and book tell the story of a young girl, Dorothy, who finds herself lost in a strange land far from home. You probably did not know, however, that the story is actually an allegory about the U.S. monetary policy in the late 19th century. I think it's interesting. From 1880 to 1896, the price level in the U.S. economy fell by 23%. That's a lot for you guys who don't know or don't care. Because this event was unanticipated, it led to a major redistribution of wealth. Most farmers in the western part of the country were debtors. Their creditors were the bankers in the east. When the price level fell, it caused the real value of these debts to rise, when, which enriched the banks at the expense of the farmers. Let me stop here and explain this to you. Um, mostly so I can display my knowledge of macroeconomics. See, when inflation occurs, especially with hyperinflation, so if you have, if you've taken a loan out, say it's a student loan, and you've taken this loan out and then all of a sudden inflation occurs, well, since inflation has occurred, your dollars are worth less. So while you're paying back that loan, you're paying it back with dollars that are worth less. So it makes it easier for you to pay back that loan. When deflation occurs, then the people that you've borrowed the money from, it makes it harder for you to pay back that loan because now your dollars are worth more. So that's why that's a big deal. According to the populist politicians of the time, the solution to the farmer's problem was a free coinage of silver. During this period, the United States was was operating with a gold standard. The quantity of gold determines the money supply and thereby the price level. So, I'm gonna stop here again. Um, when we were on a gold standard, it was called um, commodity money, meaning that if your money is backed by gold, you literally have to have the same amount of money equal to the amount of gold that you have. If that, I hope that makes sense to you. Right now, the U.S. and most countries are on what's called a fiat system where the money or the value that is placed on the money that you spend is basically governed by the government. Like the government's like, yeah, that piece of paper is worth a dollar, so it's worth a dollar. All right, let's continue. The free silver advocates wanted silver as well as gold to be used as money. If adopted, this proposal would have increased the money supply, pushed up the price level, and reduced the real burden of farmers' debts. Debate over silver was heated, and it was central to the politics of the 1890s. A common election slogan of the populists was, We are mortgaged, all but our votes. Uh, I think they could have done better. One prominent advocate of free silver was William Jennings Bryan, the Democratic nominee for president in 1896. He is remembered in part for a speech at the Democratic Party's nominating convention in which he said, this is so stupid, You shall not press down upon the brow of labor this crown of thorns. You shall not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold. <sighs> Dumbass. Rarely since then have politicians waxed so poetic about alternative approaches to monetary policy. Nonetheless, Bryan lost the election to Republican William McKinley, and the United States remained on the gold standard. Which was stupid. L. Frank Baum, author of the book The Wonderful Wizard of Oz, 
was a Midwestern journalist. When he sat down to write a story for children, he made the characters represent protagonists in the major political battle of the time. Here is how economic historian Hugh Rockoff, writing in the Journal of Political Economy in 1990, interprets the story. And this is the part that's most interesting. So, Dorothy represents traditional American values. Toto is the Prohibitionist Party. They're also called the Teetotalers. The Scarecrow represents farmers. The Tin Woodsman is industrial workers. The Cowardly Lion is William Jennings Bryan himself. The Munchkins are the citizens of the East. The Wicked Witch of the East is Grover Cleveland. Wicked Witch of the West is William McKinley. The Wizard is Marcus Alonzo Hanna, chairman of the Republican Party. Oz is the abbreviation for, for Ounce of Gold. And the Yellow Brick Road, repre the Yellow Brick Road represents the gold standard. In the end of Bound's story, Dorothy finds her way home, but it is not by just following Yellow Brick Road. After a long and perilous journey, she learns that the wizard is incapable of helping her and her friends. Instead, Dorothy makes instead Dorothy finally discovers the magical power of her silver slippers. When the book was made into a movie in 1939, Dorothy's slippers were changed from silver to ruby. The Hollywood filmmakers were more interested in showing off the new technology of Technicolor than in telling a story about 19th century monetary policy. Although the populace lost the debate over the free coinage, coin, coinage, coinage of silver, they did eventually get the monetary expansion and inflation that they wanted. In 1898, prospectors discovered gold near the Klondike River in the Canadian Yukon. Increased supplies of gold also arrived from the mines of South Africa, as a result, the money supply and the price levels started to rise in the United States and other countries operating on the gold standard. Within 15 years, prices in the United States were back to the level that they had prevailed in the 1880s, and farmers were better able to handle their debts. So, I thought that it was an interesting story, probably just because I have my nose in that stupid book most of the time. But, I hope you guys found it kind of interesting too and learned a little about our U.S. monetary policy. All right, that's it. I'm done.